Okay, good morning, everyone. It is a pleasure to see everyone. It, compared to how it's been the last few weeks, this looks like a full house to me. <laughs> I feel like we've become a mega church all of a sudden. So let's, uh, let's, let's pray and thank the Lord for our fellowship together, and let's get started. Father in heaven, um, it is a privilege um, to be with your people. Um, It's a privilege to be able to speak about your glory together. Lord, I am very thankful um, to see all of the faces um, of your people, my brothers and sisters, um, my friends, um, my family. Um, Lord, um, it it feels like it's just been too long and um, um, it's it's a real treat. Lord, we pray that you please bless our worship today. Please bless this time of teaching. Um, I pray um, that just like Philemon um, uh, was a refreshment to the brethren, I pray that this, this less, lesson would be a refreshment to my brethren. Um, I pray that it would be understandable, um, that um, they would look in your word and that they would see your glory, that the Lord Jesus Christ would be honored in it, that we would all be encouraged to reflect his glory in our lives. Um, so, Lord, thank you once again. Um, we ask these things in, in, the, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has redeemed us, saved us, and has given us this access to you, Father. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay. So, uh, today's lesson is the glory of God and the acts of the apostles. Um, so, up to this point, we've, we've had an introduction from Pastor Michael on the glory of God. We've also had a few lessons from our brother Noel about the glory of God in the Old Testament. Um, he looked in, at the word kabod, um, old, meaning old, heavy, but usually used for glory in the Old Testament. We also had a few lessons from our brother Ryan about the glory of God in the Synoptic, in the synoptic Gospels and in the Gospel of John. Um, we, saw the transfig- we saw the glory of God in the Transfiguration and in the birth narrative. We saw the, the glory of God um, in Christ um, and his death and resurrection. And this morning, we get to the book of Acts, the Acts of the Apostles. So for the sake of of review, um, when we speak about God's glory, what are we speaking of? What are we speaking of? Can anyone answer that for me? And for the lack of us not having a mic to pass around, if you you mention something, I'll just mention what you say um, on the mic here. Um, Oh, we do do have a mic. Um, So um, uh, can someone someone briefly define um, what is God's glory? Thank you, brother. So, God's glory could be described in a number of different ways. Yep. Um, we could say that God's glory is God's self-revelation. Um, God's glory is um, who God is in and of Himself, uh, the manifestation of His attributes. Um, yeah. Amen. Yeah. yeah. yeah Thank you, brother. Yeah, it's, it's one of the hardest terms to define in the Bible. It's used so many different ways. Um, there's so many aspects to it. Um, and an easy definition is to say, yes, the, the self-revelation of God, but you can't say that that's exactly it. Like that's exactly what the, what the word glory is when we talk about the glory of God. Um, but it is a nice broad definition. It's a good start. And, and, it may, and it may be good to let that be your first thought when you think of the word glory, to think of God's glory as God's self-revelation of himself. Um, so... <clears throat> Uh, When you see references to God's glory in the Bible, um, you are generally seeing God revealing himself in some way or ways. And um, and he's making his perfections, uh, who he is, known to us. Um, And he's uh, he's choosing to give us a sense of his powerful presence, um, giving us some knowledge of who he is. Uh, And we have no knowledge of who God is apart from himself himself 
apart from him revealing himself to us, if God chose not to reveal himself to us, we would not know anything of God. We would not even know of the concept of God. Um, the only way that we can know anything of him is by him revealing himself to us. Another helpful way to think of the glory of God is to think of it as both intrinsic and extrinsic. So intrinsic meaning that it belongs naturally to him. It's within him. Um, it being um, like what Pastor Mark said, who he is. Um, God is glory, so rather God is glory. God's glory isn't only talked about as something that is seen or experienced by men. It's, it's, it, is, it is who he is. Um, in many places, it's talked about as an attribute or a, or a summary of his attributes. Um, in Psalm 24, he's referred to as the king of glory. Um, in Ephesians 1, he is referred, the father is referred to as the father of glory. In James 2, Jesus is called the Lord of glory. Um, even in, our, in the book that we'll be looking through today in Acts, in Acts chapter 7, Stephen, um, in uh, recounting the history of Israel, he's, um, he, he mentions how God, the God of glory appears to Abraham. He's not talking necessarily about the revealing of God in all of those cases. In those, in those cases, it's not necessarily talking specifically about God's being revealed. It's talking about glory being intrinsic to him, something within himself. Um, and many, many describe this as um, the infinite fullness of his perfections. When you think of God's glory, it is all the goodness that is in God, all, all that is God in himself. Um, and, uh, and that's a good way to describe God's intrinsic glory. Because when we see, when he does display his glory, it's generally displayed highlighting his other perfections. So, uh, for example, in Isaiah 6, uh, which Noel went over some weeks ago, we saw how God's glory is tied to his holiness. Uh, you have the seraphim in Isaiah chapter 6 saying, holy, 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 um, the whole earth is full of his glory. They're tying his, glory, his holiness to his glory. Um, in Ephesians 1, you have that beautiful um, description of the work of the Trinity and our redemption. And you see, you see God's glory tied to a number of attributes there and God's election, uh, um, predestination. Uh, you, you, see, uh, you see it tied to, um, so I should say, tied to his attribute of his sovereignty. You see um, it tied to um, his grace and his mercy upon sinners in that case. So, um, so these displays of his glory um, those are his ex extrinsic displays of glory when he shows himself, um, when the extrinsic meaning that which is coming out of him, that which he decides to let you see of him, that is his extrinsic glory. Um, so God is intrinsically glorious. Um, he's infinite from eternity. He is the fullness of perfection. Um, and he has no need to display his glory. He doesn't, he is, he is glorious before there was anyone to display glory to. But for his own purposes, he chooses to reveal himself to us extrinsically. Um, and it gives us a very infinitesimal, minuscule view of, of who God is. It's not even a... It's not even a half of a spoonful of a taste of, of the goodness that is in God that we can see. Um, so um, uh, the reason that I explain what intrinsic and extrinsic to you is to sort of give you a feel um, for when we go through, um, when we go through any book of the Bible or you go through the Bible as a whole and you're trying to see um, what is this about God? What is this glory of God? Um, and you can see that it's a daunting task to try to um, take God's glory, you know, put it in a nice outline and present it um, for what it is. It's, an in, it's almost indescribable if you try to explain God's glory um, to someone. And um, 
And, and you can see even what is displayed to you extrinsically is not even close to what he is intrinsically. So the extrinsic, what's outside, what is shown to you is always going to be smaller than what is intrinsic, which is what is in God, who he is, his glory within himself. So, um, so it's a daunting task, but we're going to do our best. Um, it would be foolish, right, to say, um, well, you know, we can't know everything of God's glory, so we'll, we'll, we won't attempt to know anything of God's glory, right? Because the Lord has spoken, and he has given us a picture of his glory. So we have a duty to find out um, what it is that we can see of his glory in the scripture, um, at the same time, it would also be foolish for us to say, well, yeah, you know, I, I read that Bible front to back. I've read it front to back a hundred times. I think I got a good grasp on who God is, right? That's foolish also. You don't know God like that, and you will never know God like that, even for eternity in heaven, even, even in your glorified body with your glorified mind being completely free from sin, you will never ever know all of the fullness that is within your God. Um, so it, it humbles us too. And we understand that this is, a, this is an exercise in futility, but it's a beautiful futility. So let's, 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 uh, let's engage in this very arduous task of looking into God's glory. So, so we have this wonderful book, the book of Acts. And the book of Acts is a narrative of the beginnings of the spread of the gospel and the establishment of the church after the resurrection and ascension of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so uh, you, you've already had the gospels, you have the account of Jesus, um, Jesus' life, of his death, of his resurrection. Now we see what comes next. What comes next? And what's next comes the church. And in chapter one, just to give you a little rough, over, very oversimplified outline of the book of Acts. In chapter one, we have the resurrected Christ explaining to his, disciple, his disciples of how he will send the Holy Spirit and how they will be witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. He says that in verse eight. Um, uh, this is the Lord Jesus Christ before he ascends into heaven. Starting in verse 7, he says, It is not for you to know times or seasons that the Father has fixed by his own authority, but you will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. And this, this verse, verse 8, is sort of an overall theme to the book of Acts. When you trace from the beginning to the end of the book of Acts, what you see is, um, you see Jesus, he ascends into heaven. Um, the spirit that he has promised comes, the Holy Spirit comes. Um, he alights on God's people. And then from that point on, this, this promise of God's people receiving power and being, becoming his witnesses um, from Judea to Samaria and to the ends of the earth um, happened actually in that order throughout the book of Acts. And this is a tracing of that. Um, so, so this is, uh, I've heard some people mention that uh, they like to, th this is called the Acts of the Apostles, this book. Um, you could also think of it as the Acts of the Holy Spirit and, uh, and the resurrected power of Jesus Christ. So in chapter two, we have the day of Pentecost, where the Holy Spirit comes to rest on the disciples of Christ and dwelling on God's people. And from chapter two on, the gospel spreads rapidly, very rapidly, by the thousands. Um, and it starts in Jerusalem, going, into, going to the ends of the earth. In chapter seven, we have our first, we have our first witness who is killed our first martyr um, in Stephen, um, a, great, a great example. Uh, I, um, my, um, I love Stephen. <laughs> um, this, I, uh, I, I remember being first converted and this, this being one of the most encouraging accounts in the Bible to me. Um, so in chapter seven, we have Stephen, the first martyr. Um, we're introduced to Saul. Um, 
at the, on the very heels of the death of Stephen, the people who stoned Stephen, they laid their garments at Saul's feet. Um, Saul, who later becomes Paul. And we end up seeing um, um, Paul's conversion um, in, in chapter 9 of Acts. And um, uh, you also see um, that starting in around chapter 10, you see the Gentiles start to hear the gospel preached to them. And um, by chapter 13, Paul is sent off on his first missionary journey. And from there, Paul is the primary one followed in this book here. He, uh, he ends up returning back to Jerusalem in chapter 15. He goes out again, only to come back to Jerusalem again in chapter 21, where he's arrested. Um, he ends up appealing, he ends up uh, uh, in his arrest, giving multiple chances to preach the gospel again, he, is, uh, he appeals to Caesar, um, and by God's will, he ends up in Rome. And that's where, that's where the book ends. So um, the book of Acts is a very beautiful book. You see, you see how the Lord has decided to start and, and build his church. So, so how are we going to tackle this book today? This is a big book. This is a big book to try to tackle the glory of God in. Um, so we're going to, um, I'm going to take a similar approach to, to what my brothers took in previous weeks. Um, we're going to take a quick look at each of the direct references to the glory of God in the book of Acts. Um, and, and to be fair and to, and to be understanding, we, that's not an exhaustive look at glory in the book of Acts, but it's a good starting point. Um, so you don't want to think that because um, uh, you, uh, the word that we're going to be introduced to is doxa, um, this is the noun for glory, um, or doxazo, the verb for glorify. Uh, you don't want to think that every time you see that word, you know it, it, um, it, it specifically means um, uh, glory in this way. Um, it can mean, it has other meanings to it. Um, brightness, majesty, splendor. Um, also too, you don't want to assume that if you're reading another portion of the text that, and it doesn't have uh, either of these words, that is not talking about God's glory. Um, God's glory um, is implied in many respects. You might even be able to make an argument that is implied in, many, in more times than you would see that word. Um, but it's a good place to start for us, um, and that's where we're going to start. Um, so we're going to look... Um, uh, we're going to look at these references, and then we're going to pull three themes, um, th uh, three themes of glory out of this book. Um, the first theme that we're going to pull out is God's glory in the Holy Spirit's powerful witness of Christ. We're going to look at God's glory in the Holy Spirit's worldwide witness of Christ. And we're also going to look at God's glory jealously guarded. So... Um, so starting with these references um, to Docs, and we're not going to go to each passage um, at this point. We're going to go to the passage as we go through the themes. But I want to give you a, a, a look at, in the book of Acts of how glory is set, the, the, these words for glory are set out. So um, uh, in, we have nine total references um, to, uh, of glory, and five of those references are, are, are nouns. Um, the word, uh, I'm sorry, four of those references are nouns. Um, two of them are direct references to God's glory. Um, the first one being Stephen uh, mentioning the God of glory appearing to Abraham in Acts chapter 7, verse 2. The second one is when Stephen very clearly sees the glory of God. This is the most explicit view of glory in the book of Acts, <clears throat> um, where, where glory is called out and where it is seen for what it is. Um, uh, then you have uh, somewhat indirect references um, to glory, um, the noun doxa. You have uh, uh, Saul, later Paul, who encounters the risen Christ. You first see that in Acts 9, um, verse 3, but the actual word isn't used there. 
But Paul does use the word glory in Acts chapter 22, verse 11, when he gives a recounting of what has happened to him um, when he was converted. And he, he refers to the, the light of the, the glory of the light. Uh, and it could be translated the brightness of the light, but we can, we'll talk a little bit more about that when we get to it. Also, um, Herod, we have another indirect reference to, to um, God's glory. Um, we have Herod in Acts chapter 12. Um, Herod, the, uh, one of the persecutors of the church, Herod who killed James. And Herod, um, uh, he preaches uh, to the folks of Tyre and Sidon, and he refuses to give God the glory, and we'll see what God does to him. Um, we also have five references to um, the verb for glorify. So you have Jesus, um, uh, you have Peter mentioning how Jesus is glorified in the healing of the lame beggar in Acts chapter three. You have in Acts chapter 4:21 how the people glorified God for the fact that the lame beggar was healed. Um, they had just heard, they saw the lame beggar healed, they heard the preaching of the gospel, and they glorified God. Uh, the people glorified God on Peter's report of Gentiles' conversions in Acts chapter 11, 18. You have the Gentiles, Antioch and Pisidia. They glorify the word of the Lord in Acts 13, 48. And this is a, this is a major theme in the second half of the book of Acts, how, the gen, how God is being glorified by the people because of his work in the Gentiles. Um, you also see that too with James and the other elders glorifying God for saving the Gentiles when Paul um, meets them in Jerusalem. And they hear of how God saves the Gentiles and it says that they glorify God. So um, let's take a look at our first, um, our first text here uh, in Acts chapter 6. I'm sorry, not Acts chapter 6, Acts chapter 3. And we're going to look at God's glory and the powerful witness of Christ. And what I'm going to do is I'm just going to walk through these texts and we'll talk about them we'll, we'll, and, and explain them as we go along here. So I'm going to start reading at verse 1 in Acts chapter 3. It says, Now Peter and John were going up to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a man lame from birth was being carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple that is called the beautiful gate to ask alms of those entering the temple. Seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, he asked to receive alms. And Peter directed his gaze at him, as did John and said, look at us. And he fixed his attention on them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, I have no silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. So you have Peter and John here. Um, the day of Pentecost is past. They are um, they're at they're at the beautiful gate, and um, they they heal this lame beggar, and they do this in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. It's very important. And he took him up. And so in verse 7, and he took him up by the right hand and raised him up, and immediately his feet and ankles were made strong. And leaping up, he stood and began to walk, and entered the temple with them, walking and leaping and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God, and recognized him as the one who sat at the beautiful gate of the temple, asking for alms. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. So um, without even mentioning glory yet, you see some of God's glory being revealed here in the healing of this lame beggar. And you see the response of the people. They're filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. 
That's a proper response when coming across God's glory. Now look at verse 11. While he clung to Peter and John, all the people, utterly astounded, ran together to them in the portico called Solomon's. And when Peter saw it, he addressed the people. Men of Israel, why do you wonder at this? Or why do you stare at us as though by our own power or piety we have made him walk? So they're very clear. This isn't by their own power that this has happened. And it's not even by their own piety. So they're not saying this happened because we're so holy or this happened because we're so powerful. Who do you think he's going to point to? He's going to point to the power of God. Though he's going to point to the holiness of God, not his own. It says, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob the God of our fathers, he's saying to these Israelites, this is your God. This is the God of the Old Testament. This is the God that you've been taught about from a child. Now, what did this God do? He glorified, he glorified his servant Jesus. That's one of those verb references to glory, doxazo, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered over and denied in the presence of Pilate when he had decided to release him. So they're saying here, look, what you see isn't our own glory. This this healing that you saw isn't a manifestation of my power, my piety. You're not looking at my attributes on display. You're seeing God on display. This wonder and amazement that you have, this is a response to God's power. This is a response to God's piety. This is, and this is Jesus Christ specifically who is being glorified in this healing. It's, it's a far cry from what you see with these uh, fake faith healers now, right? Who gets the glory with these fake faith healers? They glorify themselves, you know. You walk up on stage with a big, you know, shiny white suit and uh, you, you make a bunch of faith heal, fake healings and they receive glory for themselves. They write books. They put their face on the front. It's all about them. But in this case, it is Jesus Christ who is glorified. Uh, so, um, and he also, um, in Jesus being glorified, he's making it very clear You see how God's glory shows them their sin here. You see how Jesus is being glorified, but he also connects this, Peter, with the fact that this is the Jesus who they have rejected, who who they gave over. They rejected the promised one, the one who their God, the one who they have been claiming to follow, Um, has given them, they have rejected him. Another prophet, the last and final prophet in the string of prophets, they've rejected him. But you denied the holy and righteous one and asked for a murderer to be granted to you. And you killed the author of life whom God raised from the dead. So now he's proclaiming not just that they've rejected Jesus, he calls him the author of life here. He's, he's showing Jesus' deity, that Jesus is God. To this we are witnesses, and his name, by faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. And the faith that is through Jesus has given the man this perfect health in the presence of you all. So you see, the pur- you see the purpose here, too, behind God revealing his glory here and the healing of this man. Um, he's, he's doing it to um, bring these Israelites to repentance. He has a purpose here to call them to faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, whom they have rejected. And he says in, in verse 17, going on, And now, brothers, I know that you acted in ignorance, as did also your rulers, But what God foretold by the mouth of all the prophets that his Christ would suffer, he thus fulfilled. Repent, therefore, and turn back that your sins may be blotted out, that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord, and that he may send the Christ appointed for you, Jesus, whom heaven must receive 
until the time for restoring all the things about which God spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets long ago. Moses said, the Lord will raise up for you a prophet like me from your brothers. You shall listen to him and whatever he tells you. This Jesus that you, um, that you rejected, that um, was risen, this is the one who Moses promised to you back in Deuteronomy 18. This was the prophet that you know, Moses said, this, this is the prophet like me that God will send you. And it shall be that every soul who does not listen to that prophet shall be destroyed from the people. And all the prophets who have spoken from Samuel and those who came after him also proclaim these days. You are the sons of the prophets and of the covenant that God made with your father, saying to Abraham, and in your offspring shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God, having raised up his servant, sent him to you first to bless you by turning every one of you from your wickedness. Do you see here the connection between God's glory and the preaching of his gospel? Um, you see, you see um, connection with God, the, God, the purpose of him revealing his glory to these people was to call them to repentance, to call them to faith in Christ. And it's very beautiful here to offer them after rejecting the prophet that um, was promised to them, he is still offering a lifeline to them by faith in him. And he's even explained to them their privileged position. Um, God having made a covenant with their father Abraham. Uh, so this um, God here is being glorified not just in the fact that this lame beggar was healed physically, um, but it points to a greater reality, a greater reality. So um, I want to also show you a little bit here, uh, just in um, Acts chapter 4. So, you know, Peter and John are immediately after they're being persecuted for their testimony. In Acts chapter 4, verse 13, um, uh, they're giving, you know, after giving their defense, um, Oh, I'll start at verse 11. It says, this, uh, this Jesus is the stone that was rejected by you, the builders, which has become the cornerstone. And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. And look at verse 13 here. Now, when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished, and they recognized that they had been with Jesus. Um, look at, um, see, Peter and John knew of God's glory, and it was obvious that they had been with the glorious one. Uh, you see, um, when someone um, knows the God of glory, it's evident, and others can see it. And it's a testimony to the God of glory. Also, um, take a look at, I think I lost my place in my notes here. Uh, yeah, take a look at verse 21. Uh, and when they had further threatened them, uh, they let them go, finding no way to punish them because of the people. For all were praising, and if you have a New King James, glorifying, right? Glorifying God for what had happened. For the man on whom this sign of healing was performed was more than 40 years old. So when people come into contact with God's glory, when they are, and they see rightly, the Holy Spirit gives them eyes to see rightly, what do they do? They reflect that glory and they glorify God themselves. This is not to mean that they can add to God's glory in any way. God, you can't add to God's glory. Um, you can't add to infinity. Um, infinity plus one is infinity. But um, what they are doing is um, they are reflecting the glory um, that um, was shown to them and they, um, they show it back in their praises and glorifying God. Um, let's go to our next text um, in Acts chapter 6. So we saw there 
um, the Holy Spirit's powerful witness of Christ earlier, right? So the, um, you have the Holy Spirit, um, Peter and John having the Holy Spirit. Um, you see the power of the Holy Spirit, um, the power of Jesus Christ in the, the healing of that lame beggar. You see, um, you see the Holy Spirit glorifying God. Um, you see the Father glorifying God through that power of the Holy Spirit and that healing. You see um, the, the preaching of the gospel. Um, you see the purposes behind God's glory, behind God's glory being revealed there. So now we're going to move on to Stephen's account in Acts chapter 6. And we'll look at God's glory and the Holy Spirit's worldwide witness of the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, and starting at verse 8. <clears throat> um, and Stephen, full of grace and power, was doing great wonders and signs among the people. Then, this looks a lot like Peter and John, doesn't it? Um, he has the, he has the, he, he, this, this man has the Holy Spirit, and um, he's showing the power. Um, the glory of God is, is emanating from this man. Then some of those who belonged to the synagogue of the freedmen, as it was called, and of the Cyrenians, and of the Alexandrians, and of those from Cilicia and Asia, rose up and disputed with Stephen. But they could not withstand the wisdom and the spirit with which he was speaking. So the Holy Spirit is using um, our brother Stephen here um, to preach the gospel and to, and to preach it very boldly and convincingly. I, I, I was trying to imagine what it would be like to try to argue with Stephen in this regard. It had to be frustrating not being able to withstand um, his arguments. It reminds you, um, it's, a, it's a small picture of Jesus speaking to the Pharisees. You know, Jesus has multiple drop the mic moments in the gospels. You know, he'll say something and they just have to walk away, shake their heads, come back another day. Eventually they just don't come back, right? Just, just, just kill them is what they would rather do, you know? So uh, then it says in verse 11, then they secretly instigated men who said, we have heard him speaking, we have heard him speak blasphemous words against Moses and God. And they stirred up the people and the elders and the scribes, and they came upon him and seized him and brought him before the council. And this looks a lot like what happened to Christ, doesn't it? Um, false witnesses bringing him up. In fact, Christ promised that this would happen to his people in Matthew 10. And they set up false witnesses who said, this man never ceases to speak words against this holy place. They're talking about the temple and the law. For we have heard him say that this Jesus of Nazareth will destroy this place and will change the customs that Moses delivered to us. Um, they're referring, um, Stephen is likely referring to Jesus saying that he will destroy this temple, talking about his body, and in three days it will be built back up again. Uh, they, these people, um, typical, typical, um, uh, self, typical self, in their typical self-righteousness, they worship their customs rather than God. They worship their rituals rather than the God behind their rituals. And some of their rituals weren't even commanded, uh, especially those of the Pharisees. Um, so uh, they're, they're charging Stephen for blaspheming the temple and the law, um, and particularly their ritualistic, um, the, the rituals. And gazing at him, all who sat in the, and yeah, pay very close attention here to verse 15. And gazing at him, all who sat in the council saw that his face was like the face of an angel. That reminds you a little bit of uh, Moses in Exodus 34, where he was with, with God and his face shone. He came down from Mount Sinai and he had to put the veil over his face um, uh, because the people were too afraid. You could tell that he was with God. Well, now you're starting to see um, God um, glorify himself in our brother Stephen. And when God glorifies himself, you're going to see, this is the longest sermon in the book of Acts, a very beautiful sermon. Um, 
And I'm not going to read through the whole sermon. I wish I could. <laughs> uh, but um, there, are two, there are two themes running through his sermon. There's a theme of location running through his sermon. And there's also um, a theme of, uh, of the fathers rejecting the prophets. A theme of location and the fathers rejecting the prophets. Um, now, for location... They believed that um, Jerusalem is where God is. The temple is where God is. Um, these rituals that I perform here, this is where God is. God is nowhere else. Now, they, w they probably wouldn't say it that openly, but that's what they were really charging him for. Um, this is not, um, um, they didn't see God as bigger than um, their, the, the rituals of their worship. And at the same time, even within their rituals, um, they rejected all of the prophets from history, starting with Moses and all the way through to the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, so even in their keeping of the rituals, they were hypocrites the whole time. They didn't, they didn't glorify God. Um, they were glorifying themselves in their rituals. Um, and you have, uh, and by this point in history here, you had major corruption in the temple. Um, Jesus, he uh, overthrew the tables of the money changers for a reason. It was, it was a horrible, um, a horrible corruption. Uh, and so uh, Stephen, he rails, he rails against them, and he does this by giving an account of the history of Israel in this sermon. And he's very clever the way he does this. He starts with Abraham, and he shows that when God met Abraham, he wasn't in Israel. Abraham was outside of Israel when God met Abraham. Um, uh, Joseph, where was Joseph when he was blessed by the Lord? Egypt. Moses. Moses was rejected by his people in Egypt, <laughs> went out to Midian. <laughs> where did, he saw the Lord in you know, he, he, the burning bush in Midian. He wasn't in Israel. So, so um, God didn't need, he was, and this was all before there even was a temple. This was all before there even was a tabernacle. So God isn't limited by location. And then, even, even then, starting with Moses, Moses was rejected. And the prophets from then on, there's a long string of prophets who are rejected down to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he shows them that they were acting just like their fathers who rejected the prophets. So look here. I'm going to start at verse 1 in chapter 7. And... It says this, and he makes a very clear reference to glory here, speaking of God. And remember, too, by this point, his face is shining with God's glory. And the high priest said, are these things so? And Stephen said, brothers and fathers, hear me. The God of glory appeared to our father Abraham when he was in Mesopotamia before he lived in Haran. So Abraham in Mesopotamia, outside, but notice how also he refers to God as the God of glory. Remember how I mentioned intrinsic glory um, when we started, right? This is, this is speaking of God's intrinsic glory, the glory that is within God. <clears throat> and, and said to him, go out from your land and from your kindred and go into the land that I will show you. Then he went out from the land of the Chaldeans and lived in Haran. And after his father died, God removed him from there into this land in which you are now living. Now, uh, so again, we saw God's intrinsic glory there. We see that um, he's, he's, he's starting this theme of location throughout his sermon. Let's move on to verse 23. Um, and this is this is speaking of Moses here. So he's he's moved on to Moses at this point. He's passed up. He's gone through Joseph. Now he's on to Moses. When he was forty years old, it came into his heart to visit his brothers, the children of Israel, and seeing one of them being wronged, 
he defended the oppressed man and avenged him by striking down the Egyptian. So Moses showed his love for his brethren. He supposed that his brothers would understand that God was giving them salvation by his hand, but they did not understand. And on the following day, he appeared to them as they were quarreling and tried to reconcile them, saying, Men, you are brothers. Why do you wrong each other? But the man who was wrong, wronging his neighbor thrust him aside, saying, Who made you a ruler and a judge over us? Do you want to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? At this retort, Moses fled and became an exile in the land of Midian, where he became the father of two sons. <laughs> so Moses in a foreign land, his people also in a foreign land, and they reject him um, in Egypt. Moses um, showing his, Moses trained as an Egyptian, educated as an Egyptian, ha holding privileges as an Egyptian, rejects who he is as an Egyptian and embraces who he is as an Israelite, serving his brothers, um, defending his brother against an Egyptian soldier, and, um, and, and, and what does what is, what is his service get? He gets rejection. And he's, he's out in Midian. And, and God meets him out in Midian in the burning bush. Um, so outside of the temple. So same theme of location, but now you're starting to see the theme of rejection. So now, um, let's look at verse 44. Our fathers had the tent of witness in the wilderness, just as he who spoke to Moses directed him to make it, according to the pattern that he had seen. Our fathers in turn brought it in with Joshua when they dispossessed the nations that God drove out before our fathers. It was until the days of David, so it was until the days of David, who found favor in the sight of God and asked to find a dwelling place for the God of Jacob. But it was Solomon who built the house for him. Yet the Most High does not dwell in houses made by hands, as the prophet said. Solomon even said that same thing when the, the temple was, in, uh, instit was, was uh, I forget the word, I forget, huh? Dedicated. dedicated, thank you, brother. When the temple was dedicated. Um, it says in here in uh, verse 49, heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me, says the Lord? Or what is the place of my rest? Did not my hand make all these things? So he, now he's being very explicit. This temple that they speak of him blaspheming, it's not, um, um, God is not limited to this temple. It says, you stiff-necked people, uncircumcised in heart and ears, you always resist the Holy Spirit. As your fathers did, so do you. Which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? And they killed those who announced beforehand the coming of the righteous one, whom you have now betrayed and murdered. You have received the law as delivered by angels and did not keep it. Now when they heard these things, they were enraged and they ground their teeth at him. So up until this point, right, uh, Stephen, his face shone like an angel. He, the glory of the Lord is, uh, is upon him. And, um, and, and, and reflecting God's glory, similar to what we saw earlier, the gospel is being preached. And it's being preached with boldness and authority. And in this case, it's making the people angry. They're not responding in repentance. But, but now we're going to see a real uh, show of glory. In verse 55, but he full of the Holy Spirit, gazed into heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Think, think of that. Let's break that down just a little bit. So he, he's full of the Holy Spirit, right? It's the Holy Spirit that has given him eyes to see that. The glory of the Lord is everywhere, but does everyone has, have eyes to see? Um, God reveals himself to who he wishes. Um, the glory is God's self-revelation. 
Um, but not everyone sees that revelation as they should. But Stephen sees it very well here. He sees a very special glory. And, and who's, who's along with this glory? It's Jesus. Jesus, the God-man. And, he's, um, and what is Jesus normally doing in heaven? He's what at the right hand of God? He's sitting at the right hand of God. But what is Jesus doing here? He's standing at the right hand of God. Jesus is receiving um, our brother Stephen to himself. You see God, you, so you see God being glorified in Stephen. He's full of the Holy Spirit. You see God being glorified in the gospel that he preached. Um, and now you see, um, you see the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ to our brother Stephen, the love that our, our Lord Jesus Christ has for our brother Stephen, that he would stand and salute and receive our brother Stephen into heaven. Like, would it be wrong if he stayed sitting? Not at all. Um, but it's, a, it's an extra special um, uh, gesture from Jesus toward Stephen. Um, and, and, and you see also too in this glory that Jesus is at the right hand of God. So Jesus, he is glorified too as king and judge here. His glory is seen in multiple ways in this passage. And, and Stephen said, and he said, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. But they cried out with a loud voice and stopped their ears and rushed together at him. Then they cast him out of the city <clears throat> and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their garments at the feet of a young man named Saul. And as they were stoning Stephen, he called out, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And falling to his knees, he cried out with a loud voice, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. Stephen, seeing God's glory, um, uh, even reflects God's glory um, and the mercy that he shows to the, the ones who are persecuting him. He sees God, Jesus, standing to receive him. And how does Stephen respond? Stephen responds um, with a heart of forgiveness to the ones who are persecuting him. Um, a heart that, um, that cares for their souls. Um, also, like, think about, um, think about the, the, um, how, how this shows how Jesus, you know, he's glorified in being the God of truth. Um, remember the promise from Matthew 10 that Jesus, um, um, that Jesus gives his disciples uh, that um, those who acknowledge him, he will acknowledge before the Father in heaven. Those who deny him, he will deny. Um, you see Jesus clearly acknowledging our brother Stephen. Um, remember the promise um, in the Great Commission that he will, he, he will be with us always. Right? You see Stephen, he is... Um, he is, he, is doing, he, is, he is performing the Great Commission in front of our faces here. And, and who is with him? The Lord Jesus. The Lord Jesus. He's the God of truth. Um, he, he keeps his word. Um, that's, that's a great encouragement for our preaching of the gospel, isn't it? What better way to glorify God than to be faithful in preaching his gospel? That's a theme that you see throughout the book of Acts. You see multiple preachings of the gospel, and all of it God is glorified. Um, I, I, one thing I, I meant to mention too, when we were actually going through the the healing of the lame beggar, right? When you see when you see one of the good things about looking at these direct references to glory is the fact that you you may not see a direct reference to glory in all spots in the book of Acts, but you see, let's say we take the healing, right? If Jesus is glorified in that healing, then what does it say about all the other healings? He's glorified in that. Um, so every miracle that you see, um, God has been glorified. If God has been glorified in the preaching of the gospel here, what does it say about the preaching of the gospel in Acts 2 and Acts 3 and then, you know, um, uh, Acts 17 and Acts 21 and Acts 22, right? God has been glorified in all of that. Uh, so you can, uh, you see how far reaching God's glory is.
Now, lastly, and we'll go very quickly as I'm running out of time, and there's more here I would like to have gone through. Um, I mentioned the Holy Spirit's worldwide witness. One of the points I wanted to make here is that in Stephen making this argument that God's, uh, God is not limited to location um, in this sermon, well, after Acts 7, who begins to be converted, right? You see, the, you see the gospel being preached in Samaria by Philip in Acts chapter 8, and then the other ends of the earth. You see the Gentiles starting to be saved. So you see a running theme there, and you see Stephen's the first one to, to start to hit on that argument. Um, and you see, and in many of those cases, um, like we mentioned before in some of those direct references to the words glory and glorify, um, in some of those cases, the Gentiles are being saved, and what do the people do? They glorify God. They say, wow, God saves Gentiles. God has given the gospel to the Gentiles, and now they're being converted in droves. Right? We see that even here. God has been glorified in the salvation of, of us, um, of his people here, we Gentiles. So um, lastly, I want to look at God's glory jealously guarded. And let's go to Acts chapter 12. Oh, thanks, brother. Yeah, I think I'll get, I'll get through the rest of it. I appreciate it, bro. So, now, in Acts chapter 12, um, starting in verse 20 here. Um, so, you have Herod, right? You have Herod. Um, and Herod, he's, he's killed James, the brother of John, the son of Zebedee. And um, Herod, and he does it to please the Jews. Um, Herod's, uh, um, Herod's out for himself, you know, he'll, he'll kill who he needs to kill to get what he wants. He'll take, he's, Herod is in, in things for his own glory. And we'll see, well, we're going to see here an example of Herod um, taking, attempting to take glory for himself. It says here in verse 20, now Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. And they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took his seat upon the throne, and delivered an oration to them. And the people were shouting, the voice of a god and not of a man. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him down because he did not give the glory and he was eaten by worms. He did not give God the glory and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. You see how God views his glory? It's a glory that is not um, to be shared. Now, I want to be very careful with that. God, does God glorify his people? Yes, he does. He glorifies his people. Um, but his people are glorified in Christ. The glory of his people is, in effect, it's God's glory. Um, it is the glory of God in his people. So he shares his glory with us, but it, it, at the same time, it doesn't come from us. Herod wanted to make it look as if he had some intrinsic glory in himself. And, um, and he let the people call him God. Uh, and that's totally outside of the pattern that you see from the apostles, isn't it? So you had Paul, he refused to steal God's glory in Acts 14 when they, um, they uh, tried to confuse him for Zeus. Uh, you have Peter and John back in the passage that we read earlier in Acts chapter 3, where they were like, hey, it wasn't by our power or piety that this healing happened. This is, um, Jesus is glorified in this. But in this case, Herod was very happy to receive the glory. Um, and for us, this should be, this should be a, a terrifying text. Think about how many times you wanted glory. Glory. 
how many times you wanted to look as if you have something, you have intrinsic glory about you. It may not be your first thought, especially as a Christian, but um, you see how God, how God is jealous for his glory. He's very jealous for his glory. And you see that too with Ananias and Sapphira. They wanted glory from God, didn't they? To the point where they would, they would uh, lie about their giving. God struck them down too. Um, you have Simon Magus. He wanted glory. He wanted to buy. Uh, he wanted. To, he he wanted to buy the Holy Spirit. Basically, he wanted to buy this power that he saw um, in the apostles. Uh, and and he was rebuked roundly for it. Um, so we we ought to see God's glory for what it is. Um, God's glory in this book. You see it in the powerful witness of the Holy Spirit. Um, uh, glorifying our Lord Jesus Christ. You see it in the worldwide witness of the Holy Spirit, showing Jesus Christ to the nations. And you also see that God's glory is, is um, it's an exclusive glory. God, um, it, it is God's glory and God's alone. It is not for, it's not um, for us to, to keep and hoard or, any, or to have. Um, if we have any glory, it's a glory that is shared with us by God to reflect, to show, to show him. Um, so let's remember that. Let's let God's glory humble us. Um, let's let it motivate us to preach his gospel boldly, to see God for who he is. Um, uh, this is a very encouraging book. Um, if you go through the week, I, 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 want, uh, I encourage you to take your hand out. Um, take a look at some of the texts in your, in your spare time, maybe during your devotional time. Go through some of the questions. Um, think through how in your life you must reflect God's glory. Um, and may you, may you be sanctified by it. And I pray to be a blessing to you. Uh, let's pray. Father in heaven, um, it is a privilege um, to look into your word and, and to see um, what is true of your glory, what is true of the glory of your, your beloved Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray um, that we would be a people who reflect your glory, a people who um, would revel in your glory. Help us not to be a people who seek to attain a glory for ourselves that is outside of you. Um, instead, Lord, um, uh, may, we, may we seek all of the purposes of your glory being revealed, may we seek all of those purposes to come to pass and play our part as you have commanded us, uh, particularly in the Great Commission. Um, Lord, um, thank you for this time. Um, I pray that your people are refreshed um, by your word today. Um, I pray that they will be refreshed by our worship corporately together today. Um, and may the name of our Lord Jesus Christ be praised and glorified. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank <laughs> you.